Euh, bonjour tout le monde. Je ferai mes remarques en anglais. Euh, J'invite donc tous ceux qui ont besoin d'une traduction. Uh, French. Everyone who would like to have access to the interpretation function can do so at the bottom of your screen. English instead of flipping back and forth between English and French sentences. And uh, French translation is available as a feature through Zoom at the bottom of your screens. So, I am Eva Slowecki, the Executive Director of the Canadian Association for Global Health. For those of you who may, who may not be familiar with our organization, we are a new national organization formed through the amalgamation of the Canadian Society for International Health, or CSH, and the Canadian Coalition for Global Health Research. Our mission is to rally a vibrant global health community for action on health equity and the social determinants of health in Canada and worldwide. As we gather virtually, I want to start by acknowledging that here in Ottawa, I am on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. We acknowledge this land, not only in thanks to the indigenous communities who have been the keepers of this land for generation, generations, but also in recognition of the historical and ongoing legacy of colonialism. As we work towards creating, a more, equi creating more equitable spaces and act on, in allyship with others, let us always be committed to learning more about how we can move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. We are grateful to have the opportunity to be present in this territory, and I invite each of you here today to consider the traditional territory where you are situated today. Seeing climate change as one of global health's most significant challenges, CHH has designed and is delivering an SDG policy dialogue series focused on the relationship between health and the climate emergency. Through today's dialogue on climate change and mental health, we, ho we hope to achieve the following, to better understand the breadth and depth of the impacts of climate change and mental health, to strengthen awareness and interest amongst diverse communities, to explore the viability of current approaches that aim to acknowledge the relationship and address the impacts, to identify progressive ways forward for adaptation and mitigation, and to make sure that people know how they can engage with these activities and support progress. Before I hand the screen over to our moderator, I'd like to thank my colleagues, Amara Khan and Jessica Helwig, who have organized this important event. We also have a graphic recorder, Jordana Globerman, who will be capturing the dialogue graphically and will produce a really cool summary of today's conversation. Amara and Jessica will be monitoring the Q&A and chat boxes, so please put your questions there in either English or French for consideration during the Q&A part of the program. And remember to access the simultaneous French-English translation as needed through, through the little globe icon at the bottom of your screen. So now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Andre Picard. He is one of Canada's top health and public policy observers and commentators. He has been a health reporter and columnist for the Globe and Mail, and is also an eight-time nominee for the National Newspaper Awards and past winner of the prestigious Michener Award for Meritorious Public Service Journalism. He was named Canada's first public health hero by the Canadian Public Health Association and a champion of mental health by the Canadian Alliance on Mental Illness and Mental Health. He received the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal for his dedication to improving healthcare. And in 2020, Andre was awarded the Owen Adams Award of Honor. This award is the highest CMA award available to a non-physician. But we're pleased to have Andre here with us to facilitate this important dialogue. Andre, the screen is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you, Eva, for that uh, very kind introduction, and uh, welcome to the audience. Welcome to this policy dialogue on climate change and mental health, pathways to increased awareness and adaptive capacity. Uh, as you know, where this policy dialogue, we're going to explore this really important relationship, uh, climate change and mental health, both things that have really come to the forefront, uh, particularly during the pandemic. It's uh, been a real stress on our mental health. We've been living with all these weird weather events, and we'll talk about some of those. 
And of course, we're just uh, days away from the UN, UN Climate Change Conference, COP26, which is going to begin in Glasgow uh, shortly. And there's a lot of hope about that, but a lot of cynicism. And we'll hear that as well. As you heard Eva talk about, we want to dive into the breadth of this relationship between climate and mental health. Uh, we want to look at the unequal distribution of risks. Uh, not everybody has the, the same risks are coming from clim this climate emergency. And of course, we want to send you home with some practical strategies and policies. Uh, we don't want to just leave you depressed. We want to give you some things to work with uh, in your day-to-day -day work and your, your lives. So the format is really straightforward. We're going to have brief presentations from each of our, our great panelists. And then we're going to jump into a question and answer period, which I'll moderate. I'll start with a few quick questions and of course welcome the audience to put their questions in the, the chat function at the bottom. And uh, I already have a few questions come in, really good ones, so please add to those. Uh, vous êtes évidemment bienvenue de demander des questions en français, si vous voulez, je peux traduire ou on peut les demander. welcome actually to ask your questions in French if you're welcome and uh, some of the panelists that can actually uh, answer your uh, questions in both languages to our first speaker because I know they all have really great presentations. I've had a little hint of them. So let me start by introducing Dr. Corrine Schuster-Wallace. She's a transdisciplinary researcher working at the interface of human and physical systems, uh, employing an eco-health approach. Uh, her research is rooted in geography. It focuses on the linkages between water, environment, and health. And her program has emerged over the past decade to encompass uh, the impacts of global environmental change, uh, local water security, and how they pertain to rural, remote, and marginalized communities in particular. And that includes, of course, Indigenous communities and women. So Dr. Schuster-Wallace, uh, let me turn over the, the virtual stage to you. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre, and hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be joining you today from Saskatoon, Treaty 6 territory and traditional homeland of the Métis. And I'm here as a water health researcher, as Andre introduced me, and I'm also co-chair of the Climate Change and Health Working Group within CAGH. And I'm here to provide a context for our discussions today. And I'd like to start by saying that climate change impacts mental health in a couple of ways. The first is anxiety over climate change itself. And the second is a result of climate change impacts, such as weather-related natural disasters. And patterns of weather-related natural disasters are changing in terms of where they occur, how frequent they are, how intense they are. Um, and these include heat and cold waves, floods, droughts, associated wildfires and mudslides. And they can create conditions for subsequent disasters in and of themselves. We only have to reflect on this summer in Canada to see how weather-related events and subsequent consequences can impact mental health. The heat dome across much of Western Canada and the US, for example, that broke temperature records in much of Western, uh, in British Columbia, in Alberta, Saskatchewan, the Yukon, Northwest Territories, the drought that's impacted much of Western and Central Canada. We also had floods in British Columbia and the Yukon. And just this week, meteorologists issued a special weather statement uh, regarding a bomb cyclone. So a huge pressure drop that created winds similar to a hurricane in coastal BC. So more importantly, these weather-related disasters, particularly this year and last year, they've compounded impacts of COVID-19. And so they've created more challenges for emergency response which also needed to include measures to minimize the spread of the virus. And this is something that we're talking about within the climate change community is these compounding disasters, the compounding effects of climate change and having to deal with multiple disasters at the same time. Climate change is essentially the trapping of more energy within the Earth's atmospheric system. And this energy is what drives our wind and atmospheric moisture patterns. And this is why we see these changes in an intensification of weather-related extreme events and disasters. And so how does this men impact mental health? Well, as you'll hear in much more detail from my fellow panelists, natural disasters are a source of stress and anxiety. When threatened by floods or wildfires, people will naturally be wondering, will I have to evacuate? Where will I go? Will my house still be here when I come back? And the reality is that sometimes it won't be there or it'll be damaged beyond repair. 
People or their loved ones might be injured, may become sick, not be able to access healthcare for existing conditions, or they may lose loved ones. These losses of people, physical health, place, belongings, memories can adversely impact mental health from depression through to PTSD. And flood studies in the UK and wildfire studies in Canada have shown that while these impacts can lessen over time, they can still be evident several years post-disaster. We've seen studies on droughts in Australia that have been associated with increased suicide rates in middle-aged men. Uh, overall, there's an increasing body of evidence that indicates the associations between adverse mental health impacts and climate change impacts. However, in closing, I'd like to note that not everyone is affected in the same way and to the same degree, both by the events themselves, but also by the experiences that they have. Some people are more resilient than others on an individual basis. Some people have access to resources that buffer them from impacts to greater or lesser degrees. For example, the ability to ensure property and belongings can mitigate some impacts knowing that the loss is not absolute or that there is an opportunity to rebuild. The ability to choose where we live to minimize exposure to natural disasters is not pour réduire l'exposition aux catastrophes naturelles n'est pas disponible pour tout le monde. Les uh, réseaux uh, de sécurité sociale can also help. Forecasting can be important in terms of providing lead times to protect property and belongings to some degree, and also to facilitate evacuation, particularly of the most vulnerable, such as those in healthcare facilities and the elderly. And so we need to be having these conversations across sectors and regions, using the knowledge and evidence to reduce impacts and to provide appropriate supports. And so I really welcome this opportunity to engage in such a timely dialogue. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Schuster-Wallace for those uh, comments. I'm sure they'll generate some questions. They've reminded me we were even changing our language because of this uh, heat dome bomb cyclones or thing we talk about with our families now every day. And uh, you touched on some of the breadth of this. So we look forward to the question period. I'm sure there'll be a lot to, to delve into. So our next speaker, I'd like to welcome Dr. Vin Vincent Ajapong. Uh, he holds multiple fellowships from renowned institutions around the world. Uh, he served as a mental health expert on disaster medicine for the Canadian Institute for Health Research. He has over 120 publications in international peer reviewed journals and over 80,000 subscribers to his various supportive text message interventions, including the Text for Hope program, which you can look up, uh, which he launched during COVID-19 in Alberta. So uh, Dr. Ajapong, uh, welcome. The virtual stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm doing a very brief uh, presentation, uh, which complements the uh, the presentation made by our eminent first speaker, looking at some of the research that have been done on climate events that's happened around the world. And I want to uh, highlight this particular presentation that sheds light on some of the evidence. This is a particular presentation that looked at 2 million uh, people randomly sampled in the US. And they did find that if temperatures increase above 30 degrees Celsius, there's a probability of mental health difficulties increasing by 0 0.5 points. And if there's one uh, degree Celsius of five-year warming was assisted with 2% point increase, in the prevalence of mental health issues. Next slide, please. So we've also done some review looking at the various mental health effects. And uh, there's a publication that can be accessed on Journal of Anxiety Disorders. Next slide, please. So another review also sheds light on the various ways in which climate change could climate change ev events could impact mental health. So it distinguishes them into three. It talks about acute events such as hurricane floods, wildfires, subacute or long-term changes such as droughts, heat stress, and also existential threats of long-lasting changes, including higher temperatures, rising sea levels, etc. Next slide, please. <clears throat> 
So let's focus on wildfires and uh, give some examples of research that have been done uh, in, here in Canada. Next slide, please. So this is actually also a review that looked at various wildfire events and the associated mental health effects. Next slide, please. Specifically in Canada, we had the biggest wildfire event happen in Fort McMurray in 2016. We did survey residents of Fort McMurray six months after the wildfire. We looked at levels of anxiety, depression, and PTSD. For generalized anxiety disorder, we found about 20% of, of residents meeting the criteria for generalized anxiety disorder. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. For major depressive disorder, it was about 14.8%, 15% of residents meeting the criteria. Next slide, please. And also for PTSD, it was around 12.8%. The most interesting finding from these studies was that those who reported they received absolute support from family and friends in the aftermath of the wildfire were between eight and 10 times more protected from meeting the diagnostic criteria for anxiety, depression, and PTSD compared to those who reported they received absolutely no support from family and friends. Other variables that were looked at were support from the Red Cross. We looked at support from insurance companies and they did not make the impact that support from family and friends actually made in terms of protecting people's psychological well well-being from, from the wildfires. This also a related study that compared the mental health effects on school children, uh, grade seven to 12. And we had a control group in Red Deer, which is another city in Alberta. And as you can see, in terms of diagnosis of depression, much higher in the uh, Fort McMurray group, uh, suicidal thinking was, for example, 16% compared to only 4% in, the, in a similar cohort in the red here. Next slide, please. So we've also looked at five years after the wildfire and five years after the wildfire coincided with the first anniversary of flooding also occurring in the same city of Fort McMurray. And then it all also happened in the midst of the pandemic as well. And as you can see, Major depressive disorder was about 42% in the population. Generalized anxiety disorder, 41%, and PTSD, 36.8%. So this actually cumulative trauma of, of the pandemic on top of, of the wildfire and the floods that happened in the city. Next slide, please. Similarly, climate change can lead to earthquakes, and there are a number of different studies that have been conducted. Next slide, please. So this actually one study that looked at problems of mental issues in children who experienced two major earthquakes in remote mountainous regions. And again, you can see PTSD prevalence was 43%. Uh, it was uh, criteria for both PTSD and depression was also high at 18%. Next slide, please. This also another study that also highlights the impact of earthquakes on the mental health. And as you can see in levels of ideation, also reported in, in those who were surveyed. Next slide, please. In terms of hurricanes, similarly, there have been a number of different studies. Next slide, please. So this one that actually uh, surveyed people five to 18, eight months after the hurricane and also one year after the hurricane. And usually if the mental health effects are not kind of uh, long lasting, then you would expect the prevalence rate of the various conditions to reduce. But in this particular instance, you can see there was an increase in the prevalence rate for various mental health conditions, including PTSD, it was actually 15% at five to eight months, but at one year, it was actually at 21%. Next slide, please. Similarly, for flooding, there have been a number of different studies. Next slide, please. 
So this flooding that occurred in the UK and they looked at various mental parameters. Again, you'll see that the odds of suffering from depression, anxiety and post-traumatic disorder were elevated in those who were actually impacted by the floods compared to the group that were not. Next slide, please. This also a study that uh, complements it. Next slide, please. Another study that shares you know, the, sa the same kind of result. Next slide, please. Next slide. So climate change can also lead to food insufficiency through droughts. And there have been farming around uh, uh, in many parts of the world. There are some studies which have looked at food insufficiency in relation to mental health. These are studies in Canada and the US, not necessarily related to drought, but I'm sure it very much mirrors what we'll see in other countries where drought is leading to food insufficiency. Next slide, please. So this is actually a Canadian study that looked at depression among street youth in a Canadian setting. They looked at uh, food insufficiency and they said it was around 53% met the criteria for, for depression. Next slide, please. Similarly, they looked at, this a study in the US that looked at uh, childhood hunger and thoughts of death or suicide when they become adults. So it means that the effects of hunger is not just when people are children or experiencing the hunger situation, but it can even transcend into when people grow and become adults. So in this, they look at adults and those who had experienced hunger as children, and they realized that there were, there were elevated levels of depression and also suicidal ideation and suicidal thoughts, even in their adulthood. Next slide, please. So in effect, we can clearly see that climate change is, 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 is having a very significant impact. And uh, as I indicated from our Fort McMurray experience, support from family and friends is very critical and should be incorporated into any policy interventions that, that uh, uh, countries adopt. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ajapong. Uh, some really interesting research there. We already have some questions, people asking, is there a lot of published research? And you gave us a real uh, quick run through a lot of good Canadian research. So we'll come back to some of that in the question period. Thank you. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who is uh, Dr. Courtney Howard. She's a nationally and globally recognized expert on the impacts of climate change and human and planetary health. You've probably seen her in uh, many media appearances. Uh, she's advanced policy and advocacy on issues including eco-anxiety, movement to building, plant-rich diets, fossil fuel divest uh, divestment, carbon pricing, and on and on. There are many. Among her many contributions, uh, she led the 2017-2019 Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change Briefings for Canadian policymakers. Uh, she sits on the steering committee of the Planetary Health Alliance, the editorial advisory board of Lancet Planetary Health, uh, the boards of the Canadian Medical Association Health uh, in Harmony, the Global Climate and Health Alliance, and co-chairs the advocacy subcommittee of the WHO Civil Society Working Group on Climate Change. Uh, Courtney, I don't know how you found enough time to be with us today. You must be in that 25 meetings a day, but uh, we look forward to, to your presentation today. Thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Andre. I mean, uh, as you can see from the title of my presentation, it's uh, self-treatment, really. Um, so thank you for having me. This is a really exciting panel. Uh, I know some of you from before, and it's really exciting to meet uh, some new people. I'm here in Yellow Knives Dene territory um, in a part of the world that's already two and a half degrees Celsius warmer than it was uh, when an 80-year-old elder was born. And actually, my house sits on permafrost. So this is a very active issue uh, for me. Um, I first learned about climate change as a new grad from McGill. I went to Inuvik, which is um, north of the Arctic Circle for a locum, and I felt embarrassed that I didn't know a lot of material outside of medicine because I just spent pretty much my whole 20s in a study carol in a call room. So I just tried, I just picked up a book on climate change thinking it would be a good uh, 
adulting maneuver and I read it on the way up. And by the time I got to Nuvik, I was very worried. And so I did a lit review and ended up pulling up the Lancet's uh, first commission on climate change uh, report. This was about 2010, which said that climate change was the biggest health threat of the 21st century. And so I was like, what? I just finished training to learn about all of the world's biggest health emergencies. How did you miss the biggest one? Um, and it just happened that I looked up from the screen and started asking around. And instead of having people around me saying, no, don't worry about it. It's not a problem. People said, oh, yeah, we're three degrees Celsius warmer than we used to be. And, you know, Bob went through the ice last week and it's getting harder to hunt and to fish. And it's all really worrisome because the permafrost is starting to make landslides. So I happened to have my climate awakening moment in one of the most impacted parts of the world and happened to go from there straight to um, the family medicine forum where I was basically telling every single human I came across about this and eventually someone was like Courtney you need to go talk to my friend Warren at the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment table and, and physically steered me in the exhibition hall to that table where I met one of the founding presidents Warren Bell and ended up on their board really before I knew anything about it. So I tell you that story because quite a few people I now know have a moment like that of climate awakening where the bottom lines really drop in. And then you're in this position where you're trying to express to other people the urgency of this situation and that in itself can be quite stressful. So these are my disclosures um, and which uh, Andre mostly already went through. And this is a real reframe for those of us who trained within um, conventional health systems. I really thought that I was learning how to have the most impact on health when I learned how to be an emergency physician. And I now understand that really the work I do in the eMERGE and really most of society depends on our ecological platform. So I now think of the ecological determinants of health, things like soil, water, energy as the necessary underpinning for our social structures, our financial structures. And those of course give rise to the social and structural determinants of health. And if that's going really well, we get to build the extremely complex structure that is a high income country health system and make sure it's well supplied with all the pharmaceuticals we need, make sure it's well staffed with healthy staff. And when you think about it, um, all of that still depends on the ecological underpinning, whether it's a severe storm uh, that can take out a normal sailing manufacturer leading to supply chain deficits, whether it's, for instance, my friend who's a general surgeon in um, Vancouver ended up actually having to go book into a hotel during the heat dome because she couldn't sleep in her un air conditioned apartment and she was worried about her ability to operate safely. So it can have impacts on our ability to actually do our job. And so when I'm now speaking with uh, health practitioners and the Canadian Medical Association board, I really try to make clear that this isn't just about, you know, heat stress. This is about health systems and our ability to do our work. And I think that's a really key uh, factor. And of course, when you look at the overall contribution to health, healthcare is responsible for about 20% of overall health status, depending on, on which country you're looking at. And so really communicating this to audiences is, I find, very much about communicating a planetary health nest. And at that point, people start to get on board. But it can be extremely uncomfortable. And particularly when I had my first daughter, spent some time in the fetal position. And there's effort grief work that needs to go into coping with this. I actually, I, I'm a trained dancer, I'm a professionally trained dancer. And so I cope by dancing. Um, I've choreographed several pieces around this. This one was at uh, Pilots Monument in Yellowknife. And I needed to spend that time in nature, working with the little piece of nature that I walk around in every day, working with my community. This was done to a Lila Gilday song, one of my favorite uh, artists from up here, really, being present in the moment and enjoying the beauty of the moment in acknowledgement of really the transience of life and the reality of coming change. And so I, I mention this because it takes time to do that processing of emotions, just as if you have a loved one who um, gets diagnosed with cancer. To me, it was actually very similar um, in terms of a thought process and, and the grief work involved as when my mom got diagnosed with cancer. And so at a moment like this, when there are so many demands on our energy bucket, 
I find that coming into this space to do the work of change making, it's really, really important that I attend to the amount of energy in my bucket. There's a, a book uh, that I used to read to my kids that talks about how we all carry an invisible bucket around with us uh, every day. And I find this is a nice model to use when you're speaking with people um, about the emotional impacts of this because we can kind of picture it. So. I try to make sure that before I come to a talk like this, before I go into the emergency department, anywhere where I'm interacting with other humans, um, that I have enough energy in my bucket that I can do so in a way that's centered, where I can have a clear cognitive space, where I can buffer difficulty. And that's really important, particularly now when there's so many stresses. So things that can fill our bucket are a sense of purpose, love, patience, humor, practical help. And when you look at the, the red column there, that's basically all of COVID, uncertainty, financial worries, loss of place, of role in the world, inefficiencies, bereavement. And there's this real overlap between that and, and uh, climate change. Now, nerdy people tend to think that, okay, so now I found out about climate change. What I did was I just went and told everybody about it. But that is not a evidence-based change-making strategy, as I now know. Um, that is an implicit change-making strategy that we all tend to have. Um, and it is basically an information deficit model of change making and it doesn't work and it really takes training and thought to move out of that model or you leave your audiences like this and i'm pretty sure i've done this to andre before although he was too he was too kind to let me know it but it can be difficult because you're managing these emotions so the hard truth is that stories actually sway audiences more than evidence and we need to get good at telling those stories so i uh basically walked into my first kate meeting and i was like we need to solve climate change and they were like courtney what's your target i'm like what do you mean what's my target we need to solve climate change and luckily uh skilled environmental campaigners like our executive director gideon foreman eventually taught me that indeed you need to choose a target and these targets can be at the micro level so individual level meso level community institutional level or macro level national subnational international levels and the way to get things done is to figure out what's the evidence informed target that can make the most change that you and your team can reasonably accomplish so whether that's divestment or coal power phase out or getting our wonderful uh, new food guide um, brought into being finding a story that will move hearts to tell about that. So when we were talking about coal, we talked a lot about keeping children out of the emergency department with asthma and how that would save healthcare system dollars, how that would keep uh, kids in school, parents at work. So those were the stories that actually won those campaigns um, although we were working with evidence from the basic literature tactics like op eds, uh, running surveys that you can then uh, hopefully get a media hit on. Those are, 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 are learned skills. And when you win these things, what you find is that then more people join your team and you get more resources. So when, when it comes to coal, first, we helped to phase out coal in Ontario. We used a very similar strategy to get a commitment in Alberta and then nationally. And then that actually allowed Canada to go on to co-found the Powering Pass Coal Alliance with the UK, where health practitioners had, in fact, used a very similar playbook to obtain the UK's uh, coal phase out work there. And so really, it can be scary for people to engage with this. And it can really help to look straight at it and say, advocacy isn't well taught in most uh, health curricula, for sure. And it's a skill set that can be taught. And so I now spend a lot of time teaching the skill set of advocacy. The problem with this model that I eventually realized is that you go round and around, you get really excited. But then the dopamine hits start to get a little smaller per win. And this can be a road to burnout. And so when I ran an eco-anxiety workshop at last COP, so the last one that was held in person, I actually asked everybody there. So this is global advocates from around the world who are at the climate change negotiation. And I said, who here feels burned out? And this was the reaction. So burnout is a real risk here. And so for me, I'm, I'm starting to look at um, one of the ways I can adapt to climate change as being really, really careful to prioritize time with my children, time in nature, time experiencing joy as a way to adapt to climate change that then allows me to have enough energy in my bucket that I can enter spaces and be as effective as I can. This is Nick Watts. He used to run the Net Lancet uh, countdown. He was my boss there. He's now in charge of decarbonizing the NHS. And when he was a med student, this is what he used to say, we are too young to know what's impossible. So we do it anyway, and he's done it. And this is really the, the mindset I, I tend to bring to the work. 
and I find it's uh, fun work. I met some of the best people in my life doing it, and I've learned so much. So I look forward to the discussion and to all the work that we are going to do together. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Howard, and uh, please uh, take good care of your health. We need your voice. We need your uh, energy in this uh, discussion as it gets more important, and we're going to tap into that bucket a little later during the question period again. So our next uh, panelist is Dr. Sharon Waters. Uh, she's uh, Coast Salish and a member of the Tsumenis uh, First Nations on Vancouver Island. She initially worked in her home territory as a family doctor, but became frustrated with seeing people mostly when they were unwell. So she wanted to focus on keeping people healthy in the first place. So Dr. Waters uh, went back and studied, uh, did specialty training in public health and preventive medicine, and has worked in this area federally, provincially, and with First Nations organizations. Uh, her work focuses on the environment, mental wellness, and maternal, child, and family health. So uh, Dr. Waters, the uh, virtual stage is yours. Uh, we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Aichka. Uh, Andre and Aitneta, uh, good morning everyone. I'm in BC, so it is morning here. And I wanted to take a few minutes um, speaking with uh, these esteemed individuals that I'm on this panel with, talking about healing relationships in a time of crisis. Next slide. So this is where I'm calling you from today. Oh, previous slide. This is where I'm calling you from today. So. I am a Hulkamitnam woman. I am a Stamanis First Nation band member and I have a lot of family ties in Cowichan tribes. There are six Hulkamitnam communities and this is our home territory. And this map here shows the Strait of Georgia or the Salish Sea, uh, the, uh, uh, the lower mainland, a portion of it and Southeastern Vancouver Island. And these different colors on this map um, was gained through interviews with elders, which shows our long-standing relationships, the ways we interacted with the land, the water, the plants, the environment that makes up our home territory. Next. And I will say uh, the red star there is where I'm calling you from today. So that is Hatepnets, also known as Maple Bay, and that's uh, where I'm currently located. Next slide. And in showing you uh, that picture of my home territory and explaining it, it also gives you a bit of a view on my perspective as a First Nations person on health and wellness. This here is a depiction of health and wellness showing us as uh, human beings at the center and um, centers our emotional, mental, physical, and spiritual health. Also, uh, the next ring looks at wisdom, respect, responsibility, and relationships that we have in the green circle with our family, communities, nations, and the land. Now, land here means uh, the earth, the water, the animal, the plants, and really within this um, green circle, land or, the, or nature, what's around us, my home territory, is not different from the human members of my family. In showing you that picture of my home territory, I am sharing with you who my family is, and I have uh, responsibility and relationships and need to treat with respect my human family members and my other than human family members. Next slide. Next slide. So in terms of speaking specifically today about uh, climate change and mental health, uh, in my home territory on the west coast of Canada, here on Vancouver Island, the most striking impact of uh, climate change over the last number of years has been drought. And this here is a graph that the BC government puts out displaying drought levels at a glance across the island region in or across the province in 2021. I am on East Vancouver Island, which is one of the last bottom rows there. And you can see um, we went from level two to level four in between the 23rd of June and the 7th of July, which is when that heat dome um, happened. So we had rapid drying of the land. And this year, for the first time ever, we reached stage five drought. We have never reached that before. It has happened in multiple areas of the province. And what that means is sociological and ecological impacts are almost certain. Next slide. So within this context, you know, when we have drought of this level, it is undoubtedly going to be having 
some mental health effects across uh, the population. For many of the impacts, the human impacts of uh, climate change, it can be uh, challenging in this part of the world when we have a lot of infrastructure to uh, react to some of the impacts that we might have. It can be really challenging to sometimes demonstrate human health impacts beyond what are our mental health impacts. And those can be quite, quite profound. Next slide. And what I'll just close off here is a number of things that I want to put forward as ways to heal relationships during this time of crisis. We have, we have mental health impacts of what we're going through now in terms of climate change, and we're not measuring that very well. So in order to increase awareness, we need to look at our mental health surveillance. On the left here, you can see an, a depiction of the positive mental health surveillance framework that was established um, nationally here in, here in Canada a number of years ago. You can see there's many facets within that individual family community society. But I will comment that within that, there isn't really um, you know, our natural environment around us depicted within this um, framework, which we know from uh, Dr. Vincent Agupong and others is a very critical factor for our mental health. I think this can be rounded out by looking at examples such as the First Nations Mental Health Continuum Framework here on the right, which lists um, again, our physical, spiritual, mental, and emotional health and how that can all bring us facets of purpose, hope, meaning, and belonging. Next slide. In terms of, of steps forward, I also want to talk about some aspects I think can en enhance our adaptive capacity. And this one here is based off of findings that were found in the um, uh, Global Assessment Report of Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And this was specifically a policy for summary, uh, summary for policymakers, which showed clearly that Nature is generally declining less rapidly in Indigenous peoples' lands than in other lands, and that governance, including customary institutions and management systems and co-management regimes that involve Indigenous peoples and local communities, can be an effective way to safeguard nature. Next slide. And what I think that comes down to is what I was showing you in the beginning about a depiction of the way we view health. We view our natural environment, nature, as our relatives, as our family. And I think we also have a lot of incredible ability for adaptive capacity here in BC and across the country nationally with uh, work that's taking place there as well with our formal recognition on the rights of indigenous peoples. Here in BC, we have the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. And this basically states that we need to align all legislation with uh, UNDRIP. And particular to this conversation here today, Article 25 says that we have the right to maintain and strengthen our distinctive spiritual relationships with our traditionally owned or otherwise occupied and used lands, territories, waters, and coastal seas, and other resources to uphold our responsibility to future generations in this regard. And specifically with water and my relationship with water, I see this as an incredible opportunity to heal my relationship with water here in my home territory for people around the province to do this and to hold our responsibilities to water and our future generations in this regard. Next slide. And so in closing, with regards to one of the greatest opportunities I also see in enhancing our adaptive capacity, I want to put forward that I think we really need to have a paradigm shift. We have had a lot of importance, a lot of focus on our health system over the past 19 months, given the COVID-19 pandemic we were in. We have seen, you know, an unprecedented in our lifetimes, um, you know, focus, push of resources, push of human effort towards uh, bolstering our health system to be able to respond to this. And I think we, we need to also acknowledge that you know, during this time, a lot of us had to, stay, had to stay closer to home and being in our, our natural environments, for me, being within my home territory depicted here is part of what kept me well. And we really need to acknowledge and start with the fact that our ecosystem is our health system. And we need to be putting as much focus, effort, and human resource push into this area because this is really what has for generations upon generations kept us well.
And if we give to uh, the environment and nature, it will be able to give back to us. And especially during this time of stress and anxiety in terms of climate change, there is always time to heal and relationships during this time of crisis. So Hajka, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Waters, for, for that important message about you know, spending as much uh, attention on the ecosystem as the health system about healing. And again, we'll come back to that in the question period. I, I see more questions coming in on that topic, so we'll get to those. Our final panelist is uh, Anne-Catherine Bajard of the BC Council for International Cooperation. She's a human geographer, a feminist with focus on equity, justice, and decolonization. Uh, continuously seeking to discover and uncover and settle invisible biases and relearn with new lenses. Now uh, she's lived and worked in countries affected by uh, collective trauma such as Bolivia, Liberia and Haiti and that's provided her with a new understanding of many of the questions about population resilience uh, during and after wars, epidemics, natural disasters, and decades of political oppression, inequity and violence. So Dr. Bajar, uh, I'll turn the floor over to you, the virtual floor. <laughs> Thank you, André. Um, I appreciate being called doctor. I am not, although I think that with the experiences I've had, maybe that adds up to uh, that level of expertise. Um, I first want to inform more than acknowledge that I, re I reside on the unceded Indigenous territories of the Musqueam and Squamish peoples. The forest in front of me is Musqueam territory. But I've also lived, played, worked, and raised my children in equally unceded territories of the Aymara, Quechua, Chiquitano, and Guarayo nations of the Colliasuyo in Bolivia. And I've lived five years in the land of the Kpele, Pasa, Grebo, Sapo, and many other indigenous peoples um, in the West Africa region. So as uh, André Picard said, I have lived and worked in different countries. And what I've learned, but not just from international areas of work, but also, you know, in the Nicola Valley or in the north of BC uh, with the Métis women, the Indigenous women, the Inuit women, that there is strong experience on compound trauma, collective trauma, on compound disaster and the effects of disasters. So what I'm looking at is the positive outlook from the fact that that knowledge exists and that we tend to forget to um, look for that knowledge where it is. Uh, we do try, but then we just, my recommendations will be to do more of that connection. Um, I did have a picture that I wanted to put in the background at some point, and it was a woman that I walked with through waters at a time of flood in Liberia in a small community. And um, I was thinking, you know, if some people see it, the caption differs. Some will say, oh my God, a poor African woman struggling through water. No, to me, I should have put a caption. This is, this is resilience. This is a woman who has faced the crises of civil wars, 20 or more years of civil wars, um, then the Ebola crisis, poverty, food insufficiency, as an earlier presenter mentioned, and also climate change. When she speaks about her situation, no matter what level of education formally she may have, she knows very well what's happening. The climate is changing. We now have had floods like this two, three years in a row. And previous to that, it was only in 1974 that we had this type of small disaster. They've had bigger disasters as well. Um, so I just wanted to say that when you see this picture, please see the knowledge resides in the people that have lived such experiences internationally and within the marginalized populations or those whose voices we haven't listened to in our own Turtle Island. Um, so that said, myself, I'm here representing the BC Council for International Cooperation. We're a coalition of 50 organizations based in BC that work around the world in cooperation with. So it's not about helping others. It's about working together and sharing the knowledge amongst each other. Um, one of the goals, obviously, that we have is uh, ending poverty, inequity, access to health, education, everything that you might see in the 17 SDGs that people refer to a lot nowadays, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, the reason I mention our goals is that when we work with women like Olive here, who is of the Basa people, on the coast of Liberia, 
Olive knows very well that all those SDGs are interconnected. I just mentioned her situation, but while she was going through the flood, she was looking at the loss of livelihood. She was looking at recovering anyways from the Ebola crisis, about her children's school being closed, about the water being poisoned, about her right as uh, a Basa woman. So many of the SDGs are interlinked. She does not need us to go down and train her on the SDGs, but rather she needs us to understand her knowledge from where she is, recognize it, and recognize the strategies that she and her sector, her movement, whether it's her geographical community or her being as a woman or her being as a, as a Basa person, whatever movement and social complexity she belongs to, feels she belongs to, they will have their strategies towards the sustainable development goals. So that's probably the one thing I'm telling the public here is when you're talking about the SDGs, it's not a new thing to teach people about. It's actually a universal language that we should recognize comes from the complexity of the lives of people who have faced uh, complex situations and trauma. Going back to climate change and mental health, um, those are also the people who specifically have experience on how to deal with, work with, unfortunately suffer from as well, compound trauma. I don't have the solution. Nobody has the given solution. But the second recommendation I make to everyone as much as we can is connecting voices. So really connecting voices, not to impart knowledge, but to generate knowledge. How did your population do this? How did you fit, fix or face so many crises at the same time or one at a time? And you were a child when the first shock hit you and now you've had one crisis after another. How have you collectively or individually managed your mental well being? Um, so we learn from each other. Right now, the privileged people, such as me in the, in the global north, um, we may not have had that many shocks before. So we need to learn from those with the experience. Um, I've tried to skip examples, but you know, if you think of Chad, the Lake Basin, the Chad Lake Basin used to feed 30 or be the sustent of 30 million people. And now we've got 10 million people in refugee camps trying to find a way out of, um, of situations that are untenable. And yet somehow we have learnings to have from them. Um, in general, another message I wanted to impart thinking of the positive outlooks is that if we start looking not at inequality as a negative thing, but as the space to learn from, we can take part of the UN definition on climate change, which is about the fact that human activity has impacted our climate, our planet. The planet will go on, as somebody said, but the humankind might not. So it is also about humans uh, having affected and driven climate change, and we need to look at whose lives are directly and profoundly being affected by it. And in the global south, as we call it, which includes marginalized po populations across the entire world, um, there, is, uh, there are decades of experience that we didn't listen to. We didn't draw on it to prevent or learn adaptation, mitigation, coping mechanisms. Part of the trauma that we need to acknowledge is that sense that it's not fair. It's not fair who drove climate change and who gets the effects of climate change in uneven uh, levels uh, has that trauma of it's not fair and what survival is about. So ask yourself that as well when you're trying to set a plan on what to do with mental health, collective trauma, climate change, and especially preventing and developing adaptation mechanisms. Looking for any further tips, I think I was asked to think of key stakeholders. And I think in Canada, what's happening, which is really good and I would recommend to all is the connection between movements. So if we have green movements, if we have the um, Climate Action Network, the Climate Action Network is already reaching out to the international uh, cooperation sector. If we are across the country, just in Canada, 400 organizations working in so many countries in the world, their partners there are also networking we can share more and more knowledge and strategies. If we keep climate change to scientists on climate and public health to public health, which obviously we're not doing, there's all the environmental determinants, 
Uh, but we would be limiting ourselves. And right now we do have to add the labor sector. People are in fear of losing their jobs because of climate change, because of COVID. What's going to happen if we close the oil industry? So the stress, the distresses are happening at all levels and we need to connect different types of movements. Um, there are transnational social movements to look for. Uh, one key recommendation that came out recently on a new podcast was about in 2010, there was a climate summit of Cochabamba where 35,000 persons representing organizations from across the world had a very different take on the strategies for climate change than what was happening or had happened at the Copenhagen summit. So do look for those alternative movements. The UN has a fabulous framework, which gives us a universal language to discuss similar issues, but do not stay within just what is written. Go look for the people and go look for the movements that have long been acting. Um, finally, in Canada, don't let deciders, and this I've heard on the women's rights front, don't let the deciders or government say that it takes time and we have to do things gradually. There was fast action around COVID. We can have fast action and we just have to be really active citizens locally and globally. I said finally, but in my last 30 seconds, I would like to add for inspiration about uh, Indigenous peoples and from Indigenous peoples, do look at the movement that led to the, um, the um, UN Forum on Indigenous Affairs, which initially wanted to be about sovereignty of Indigenous peoples, not about their affairs. But it had its effect and influence, and Bolivia's constitution ended up being written by Indigenous peoples together with non-Indigenous peoples. They rewrote the constitution to respect Mother Earth, the Pachamama, and attempt to respect also equitable distribution of resources. I'll close with that. I tried to be optimistic. I do recognize that many people in my family and myself have seen, lived, and experienced trauma, that it is very hard to move forward when we feel that trauma. When one of our colleagues here spoke about the empty bucket, Courtney Howard, it resonated. I moved back to Canada after 20 years in Bolivia, five years in Liberia, thinking I'd fill up my bucket again. Unfortunately, the pandemic followed. <laughs> Uh, so do take care of yourselves, but don't keep looking only after yourselves. Use that network that somebody else mentioned, which is your family, your support, your community, and your connection to the earth. Thank you. Great, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'll call it a doctoral level amount of experience that you shared with us today. <laughs> uh, so we'll call everyone on the panel a doctor today for simplicity's sake. Uh, so I want to move right into the, the panel discussion. There's a lot of questions coming in already. I had lots of rich presentations. So there's a lot to talk about. Uh, so I'm going to get uh, all the speakers to turn on their cameras, come join us on the, the panel, and I'll uh, kick right off. I thought I'd start, to, if I could, with uh, 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 who am I start? Who was our first speaker? I'm going to start with Dr. Schuster Wallace, I guess. Uh, maybe ask you about, I want to start with a big question and the, the rest of you can wade in, but I'll start with Dr. Schuster Wallace. Uh, you know, how do you find that balance? How do you raise awareness about the, the severity of this issue of the climate emergency, but without making people feel hopeless? So, so where's that balance in the, in the work that you do in these discussions that we have today, if you want to kick us off? Certainly, we'll start with an easy one, shall we? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It, it's tough because you, you don't want to raise any more anxiety, but as almost everybody on this panel has indicated, there is an urgency here. The positive piece is that we have demonstrated COVID literacy very quickly as a community, as a global population. And so the question then becomes, how do we make climate change literacy, water literacy, environmental literacy, uh, one health, planetary health, how do we make it literate? How do we have everybody recognize and respect the environment as an important contributor to our health and well-being and our mental health? And particularly those, uh, you know, we didn't talk about the blue and green spaces, which are therapeutic landscapes. And so uh, we've talked about sort of centering um, 
Dr. Courtney talked about centering through dance, but many of us also center through walks in the environment and uh, parks and green spaces within COVID have become very important. So it does go back to the hooks. It goes back to what people value most and different people value different things for different reasons and what the benefits are to different people. And again, in some ways, do we need a little anxiety for action? Are we complacent without that anxiety? And I'll leave that for the physicians on the panel to answer, but it's, it's very difficult to convey that sense of urgency without having some level of anxiety associated with that. But as many, as everybody here has said, there are solutions. And so for me, it's not just pointing out the challenge, but also the opportunities and some of the solutions and engaging in those positive strength-based conversations around pulling everyone together and saying, yes, we can move through this. We have to recognize and acknowledge it. And then let's talk about where we need to go, but let's not, as again, someone else has said, let's not put it off for several years while we think some more and talk some more and collect some more knowledge and evidence. Let's actually start acting. And Dr. Howard, do you want to weigh in on that? I'm sure like me, when I write about these topics, people say, well, you're depressing as hell. <laughs> I'm going to tune you out. How, how do you find that balance? How do you keep people's attention, uh, even though this is not uh, uh, uplifting stuff to talk about? I, I've gone through a, a journey. I knew this was depressing. I actually just reread the ver very first thing I ever wrote. And it taught, I, I actually first did a lit review on climate change and health. And my second lit review was on happiness. I did it like immediately after. And so what I did my first presentation actually was I brought cookies. So for about the first year I did this, I would make cookies. And then when I got to the point of the presentation where I, you know, I am a physician. So I was doing an ongoing mental status exam on my entire audience as I was speaking. Um, when people looked like they were going to jump off a cliff, I'd be like cookies. And then I gradually realized that if I scaled back the amount of problem um, and added more solution, I didn't have to bring cookies. And I've ended up at a ratio of about 30, 70. And now actually I'm more often doing 20% problem, 10% explicit acknowledgement of the mental health impact of what I just said, because otherwise everybody thinks they're the only person in the room who's being upset and they actually can't process what you say next. And so I very purposefully tell my personal story several people usually get teary but now everybody doesn't feel lonely within that grief and we've created a bit of a community and then I go on to talking about solutions so actually I've, I've spoken with Nick Watts about this at one point and we realized we were both at a 30 70 ratio and so that that that's what I do um there's no evidence behind it but I think between the two of us we've given thousands of presentations on this so yeah. Yeah, good uh, practical tip. Uh, yeah, yeah. Good, good, good practical tip. I like the cookies too, so don't uh, don't give up on those. But uh, uh, I want to, Dr. Waters. I want to ask you a similar question. How do you how do you prioritize this? You know, especially in Indigenous communities, there are so many issues: uh, residential schools, lack of clean water, etc. How do you make climate change uh, the priority, or does it have to be? Thank. You. I think that's why I phrased it the way I did in terms of healing relationships. It's not so much about climate change. It's about healing our relationships with our family, which is our human family and, and the rifts that have been caused by policies, Canadian policies, such as residential schools, Canadian policies, such as removing us from our land, which was also, you know, our family and really just focusing on you know, that it's really about healing relationships and that there's, you know, none of us know where things are going to be 25 years from now. Heck, none of us knew we were going to have a heat dome like we had, you know, this past summer. But I, I, I hold firmly to the fact that if I approach this in terms of we're really just looking at healing relationships with, you know, nature around us, that there's there's always something to be gained, even if even if things like we know are gonna are gonna get hard. Because when we're you know who do we turn to you know when we're going through difficult times you know our loved ones, our friends, those who are around us. And so if we really shift 
our paradigm to that, like, you know, giving back to the environment is, you know, bolstering our health system. I think we can have so much, um, you know, capacity for healing beyond just, you know, climate change, which is obviously of the um, utmost importance at this time, but it just, the, the benefits are cumulative. Okay. And, uh, and Catherine, I want to ask you a similar question because you've worked in, in developing countries. Uh, how do you make this top of mind when there are so many things to deal with uh, all at once? I don't think that there's a feasible one one sentence answer that I could have. So it's more about the action that one of our pan fellow panelists spoke about, remaining active, but also taking care of oneself. And I'm not talking just about myself, nor about just all of that woman in the picture, nor about the collective on their own. It's it's the sense of there's an urgency to act anyway. So. When I'm going to say something that is actually a question for the scientists, and maybe it's more for the geographers. I'm a geographer myself, the social scientists, but it has to do with that question about do we need a bit of anxiety in order to move forward faster? So that's the clinical part, but socially as well, do we need that anxiety to push the policies through faster, to push our own actions faster, to survive? So unfortunately, that means that in countries where I've worked and lived, psychosocial trauma is not the priority. And that's terrible because it affects long-term, multi-generationally, the societies. But because people have to think about where's the meal coming from? Where am I going to live? Um, they, are, they continue with action, which we then call resilience or resiliency. But is it really resilience when it's a forced action that they have to have? They have no choice in a sense. Um, is it something that we want to learn as such that by having to look for food, you overcome your mental trauma? No. <laughs> so that's kind of a sad, um, vicious circle that I do see, even though I want to be positive. I'm so proud of my having seen people be resilient. And then I feel ashamed about recognizing their resilience in spite of so many traumas that continue. Mm. Great. I, would, I think I'm going to throw that question to Dr. Schuster Wallace, Dr. Adjapan. I'm going to come back to you in a second because we have a question specifically for you. But Dr. Schuster Wallace, you you study resiliency. Is this uh, aren't people resilient? Can't we get through this? Not everybody. And as I said, and this is where intersectionality comes in. Some of us are born to privilege, and and some of us are are not. And and we have oppression and so and it's not that black and white because many of us hold different identities some of which confer privilege and some of which don't and so that's at the individual level and as you've seen it's nested not just within the individual but the household and the community and and within the environment what struck me uh, that Anne Katerine was saying is that you know we call it adaptation, we call it resilience. And yet now more and more we're recognizing that there's maladaptation that occurs. And it's people responding to what they have to in order to survive. Just because a person walks further to try and find clean water because a hurricane's come through and wiped out their drinking water sources doesn't mean that that's adaptation, right? They, because it has knock-on effects on mental health, it has knock-on effects on interpersonal violence, it has knock-on effects on uh, fatigue and, and injury and uh, time to spend on other household and, and other activities. And so that is not adaptation, that is not resilience. It's a short-term coping strategy. And so we really have to be able to understand and differentiate between the coping strategies that people take on because they have to versus sustainable adaptation, which requires the support structures. And, and we've seen, um, uh, we've had sort of a lot of the evidence there in terms of some of the things that actually protect against adverse mental health under some of these conditions. And so we need to be fostering those. And that's the resilience, that's the adaptation. It's not the coping strategies. And Dr. Hajapan, thanks for your, your patience. Uh, I was waiting because the question that was aimed at you is on a completely different topic. 
Uh, people are asking about what's the role of data and what are the challenges of getting data in this area? You know, for example, how do you know someone's anxiety is caused by climate change and not by their job loss or their kids being difficult? How, how do you tease that out in the research? Well, I mean, for example, in the wildfire study that I referenced for school kids, we actually looked at school kids who were in Fort McMurray and those who were in another city where which had not been impacted by the fire. And we could clearly see that there was a significant increase in, in the same province, same economic situation. Uh, similarly, if you look at even the other study that I referenced, where we looked at five years after the wildfire and there had been uh, flooding and there had also been the pandemic, we had also collected data for those across the province who had been impacted by the pandemic. And you could see clearly, if you look at the different publications, that the level of anxiety, depression, and likely PTSD that has been reported in Fort McMurray is much higher. So, I mean, clearly you can be able to tease out that th these are cumulative trauma contributing to, to, to the additional stresses. And, and so data has a very important role to, to actually play, play in all of this. And Dr. Howard talked about telling stories, not just data. How do you, can you transform that data into stories easily enough? I, I think so, yes. So um, I actually just, uh, I'm, I'm starting writing a paper with Dr. Ajapong. So it's really nice to, to meet him. And it's on wildfire adaptation. And we did a big wildfire study up here. Um, and we had a quantitative and a qualitative part and the qualitative part was community-based interviews. We partnered with the Yelvanaz Dene and the Kagatu First Nation and had community coordinators go into their communities and ask people how they felt during what we call the summer of smoke. So a, a smoky season in 2014 that lasted two and a half months. And so we ended up with this really rich um, source of quotes that was then analyzed by a, a PhD student um, with themes drawn out. And we actually found that when we went to recommend policy change, most of the insights came from the qualitative study. The quantitative study told us, yeah, there was double the amount of asthma, um, tons of salbutamol was dispensed. But the qualitative study said, what was really interesting was that the people who were the most active in pre preparing, the people who told us that they fire smarted their homes, that they had an alternative evacuation route prepared, so they lined their boats up beside the river in case the highway got closed, um, the, the entire tone of their interview is different. So they, you could tell that they, they felt empowered, they felt hopeful, they felt proud of themselves. And so those are the stories that we've been using to illustrate the quantitative data, uh, whether we're talking to media or policymakers. So I think in some senses, this has to do with the way that we um, do our research and then the way we talk about the research. So I, I actually went to Fort McMurray to see what it looked like. And I stood in the parking lot of the emergency department. There's burned out trees visible in two directions. And so now when I'm talking about the Fort McMurray fire, I usually tell my personal reaction, I, I got tachycardic thinking about what it would have been like for me as an emerge doc to try to evacuate. It's a hundred bed hospital in a matter of hours as they did. And so I think it's a matter of making sure that we do the studies and then we adhere to the communications evidence base, which exists, but we need training in it to make sure that we're communicating the evidence in an evidence-based way. Great. And I'll just add, as a journalist, I think we want both of those. We want the data and then we want the people stories to, to bring the numbers to life. So that's the ideal. And then a bonus is having a good, uh, a good headline like Summer of Smoke. So it looks like you have a good paper coming, has all the elements. Um, if I could interject, I'm sorry, Andre. Yeah, if, yeah. if I could interject, this is a really important point because it's we have to redefine what data and evidence are because qualitative data are still data. And yes, they're stories, but they're data. And we need mixed methods approaches. We need traditional knowledge. We need traditional ecological knowledge. We need the qualitative and quantitative, and we need to value these. 
equitably and, and not just go straight to the quantitative because more and more we're realizing that it, it, the evidence, it, it needs to be brought from diverse perspectives and it goes to voices and whose voices we're hearing. But I just wanted to make that point as well because that's really important. Great, and I, Dr. Waters, maybe you can weigh in. Uh, storytelling is really important in First Nations communities. Uh, can you talk about that, uh, the importance of that in the climate debate? Sure, I always think of um, a particular health director in BC who um, I was previously at the First Nations Health Authority as the director of health surveillance. I came and uh, presented some graphs and he was like, oh, Dr. Waters, it's all just squiggly lines on paper to me. And, um, you know, I, I have just always thought of that. And um, yeah, like the stories, the data helps elevate within certain uh, groups. You know, often when money is a conversation, you need the data. Like, I mean, we're, we're in the middle of the, you know, COVID here and like how, like we have data daily in some cases of, you know, how many cases have been diagnosed, how many people are in hospital, like, like that data moves things along. It makes it, you know, you know, important. But do we remember what, how many cases there were last week? No, like the lasting impact is the stories. You know, like you remember when, for instance, unfortunately we have a number of stories, you know, in different parts of the province for, with people who lost family members who maybe for whatever reason didn't get vaccinated. Like th those are the things that, we remember and it and it's it's what what can people remember you know three weeks from now when something comes up and they have a choice in their work environment to front and center some of the things say for instance around climate change and mental health that's that's where people's hearts and minds like you know really come together and um i think that a lot of that comes down to like many of us shared here today like local experiences embodiment of what it means to be going through you know, the mental stress of climate change impacts within the areas we call our home. So I, I, I think, I think, yeah, when you, when you combine those together, it creates a population that uh, connects with the issue and also the impetus for importance and, you know, quite frankly, dollars to be put forward to, you know, enacting, um, you know, policy and other things to bring about positive change. And while I have you, I think I'll set, send another question, audience question to you, because you've lived through many climate events in BC in the last year or so, uh, bomb cyclones, heat domes, droughts, wildfires, you've had it all in BC. Someone's asking, how can we do a better job of communicating about these uh, extreme events? Uh, uh, to maybe talk about some of the pros and cons you've seen in the communication of these events that you've lived through. Yeah, um, I think, you know, transparency, uh, uh, regularity, uh, like, I mean, with the heat dome uh, this summer, to be perfectly honest, like no one was prepared for that type of heat here in this type of the country. And, and like, we did have a, we did have some warning and then suddenly it was there. And, you know, really we, you know, had and we're also dealing with a health system that's really overwhelmed with a spike of um, people who are really sick with COVID at the same time. So it really emphasized to us, you know, that we need to do a lot more preparation in terms of being prepared for these types of events. You know, we will be moving forward within summers prepared to roll out communications about how to, you know, look out for people who are more vulnerable, check in on people who don't have air conditioning. So that's like in the heat of the moment, I think there's also the preparation and then there's the debriefings. I've been in a number of debriefings um, over the past number of weeks with regards um, to in particular, the heat dome and, you know, what, what are, what, what was most impactful? What, what do we need to work on and really I think that that flow of information of how it gets from you know say for instance Environment Canada with the weather warning through the health system and down down to individuals connecting with each other or knocking on each other's doors to see how people are doing um, you know really mapping that out and making it a fluid flexible and adaptable um, you know framework that can be uh, transferred to flooding <laughs> to wildfire smoke 
um, is, is something that really needs to be, you know, front and center and, uh, uh, you know, something that we're communicating, I think, just as often as we're communicating about something like COVID to, to the community, because each, each season, unfortunately, now has its, you know, ex extreme weather events related to it that we need to be all working together to uh, address. Okay. Uh, and Katrina, I think the next question I'll send your way, uh, someone who's worked uh, all over the world in different types of communities. Someone's asking, how do you foster collaboration in different communities uh, between academia, civil society, government? How, how do you make sure the voice of, of people is heard in those, in those communities across the spectrum? Well, my empiric evidence is that the closer we are to where the people are actually experiencing and living the issues, whether they're complex or, or one single issue, the more likely people are to converge from different sectors. When we start to specialize and separate out, it's harder to bring people together. So in, I'll use Liberia, which is uh, one of the countries that I love and have lived many years. Um, it was not difficult to convene people from government, academia, civil society, communities, NGOs, national and international, when the issue was about um, access to water and sanitation and hygiene. Uh, we were all at the same table. Even class and ethnicity were no longer an obstacle because the urgency of the issue brought us together. Um, the same might happen here, hopefully, now that we know or we need to say to Canadians in general, this is not new. This is decades and decades and decades of people, other people than us in Vancouver, UBC region, other people than us have experienced this. If we're starting to feel the urgency, we need to connect with them. So yeah, part of the matter is urgency. Another point that I wanted to bring in that's related is the connection to the land. And so there's a cause and there's an effect. So because of climate change, you have forced migration when people disconnect from their own land, how do they connect to the new land? And I'm not talking about immigration and cultural adaptation. I'm talking about understanding and loving your land, that connection to the land. You're going through grief at the loss of your own land and you have to survive. What's happened in Bolivia, one of the experiences to study further is a program that was the colonization program from the 70s where people from the highlands because it was so arid and hard to cultivate any food substance from there the colonization of the amazon basin by those populations which are aymara and quechua they went to colonize the populations and the land and territory of the populations of the amazon and their connection remained with the highlands not with the amazon so they are part of the exploitation and destruction of the amazon basin even though they are very connected to land and territory, but it was their homeland and territory. So if we can think again about connection of the land, whether it's the big CEOs of companies or whether it's uh, somebody who has been displaced due to civil war, reconnecting with the land. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, it, it underscores the, the complexity of is, this issue, that story as well. So we have a few minutes left. I always like to end, try and end panels on a, on a hopeful note. So I want to ask you to, to each of you uh, briefly to send us home with a hopeful message. Uh, what makes you hopeful that we're going to address this issue of uh, climate change and mental health in particular? Uh, what little tidbit of, of hope can you give us? Uh, I'll go in order that we started. I'll start with Dr. Kareen Schuster-Wallace, if I could. It's the mainstreaming of the conversation and the fact that we can have panels like this and dialogues like this. And it's also the engagement of civil society in COP and places like that. So it's the grassroots, that's what gives me hope. Great. Uh, Dr. Ajapan, uh, what, what gives you hope that we're going to address the, these big issues, uh, climate and mental health? Yeah, I think for me, it's, it's really about the fact that uh, what's been found in the research, not just what we've done, but in, in various other disasters, is that what really actually helps people cost almost nothing is just about community supporting each other. So I think it would be useful for this message really to go to communities that are going through 
a tragedy going through uh, kind of climate change uh, impact events so that at least they, they, they know that they need to support each other. Similarly, people who live in different places but have family members or friends in communities that have been impacted should rally around and provide that level of support. It's more impactful than any material support that people can be able to provide for the community. Right. Yeah, and your research really underscored that importance of family support, of community support in, in getting through this. Great. Uh, Dr. Courtney Howard, I know you're always positive, so uh, you can give us a, a closing comment uh, that's positive. I, I, I am positive. You know, when I first started doing this, it was lonely. Nobody else was talking about it. And now it's not lonely. Um, the healthy climate prescription that the Global Climate and Health Alliance um, put forward that the head of the WHO climate team is actually going to deliver at COP after cycling all the way from Geneva has been supported by organizations representing 45 million healthcare professionals worldwide. And it's the very first year that health has actually been part of the official scientific program at COP. So we're starting to bring the power of the trusted voices of probably the biggest evidence-based ethics-driven sector of society. Health, health controls 10% of global world product to the biggest health emergency. And when you think about what that can do in terms of shifting markets, if all of the hospitals shift to renewable electricity, if we divest from fossil fuels, that starts to send a signal to the entire world that a low carbon healthy transition is inevitable. And so I'm seeing that power in numbers. I'm seeing the strategy in a way we've never ever had before. And I think we're gonna see tremendous change in the next few years. Great, that is a hopeful message. Uh, we're gonna cling to that one. Uh, Dr. Shannon Waters, uh, are you hopeful? Yeah, um, and I spoke to it briefly when I shared slides earlier. I mean, one of the things that makes me the most hopeful right now is the legislative opportunity we have in this country. Uh, we, BC, have, we have law that says we have to align all our legislation with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, with front and centers, which says relationships spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically with our environment need to be protected. So I think that is an unprecedented opportunity within the timing of this country we live in called Canada to be able to heal relationships, which I ultimately think will go a very long way to uh, addressing one of the issues of damaged relationships, which is climate change. Great, thank you. And then Catherine Bajar. I think my hope stems from the fact that in Canada, the mass media has now made colonization, decolonization and recognition of abuses um, a conversation that is uh, massive right now. And that may allow us to look at everything we do internationally, locally with a decolonizing lens. I actually usually don't like using the word because it confuses the issue. It's not the, oh, I'm politically correct talking about decolonizing but it's about seeking equitable, equal to equal dialogue with people, among people, learning from each other, no matter where you are, where you're from, et cetera. So if we can go past just lamenting, regretting, apologizing for uh, what happened in residential schools and really look at everybody has agency, everybody has governance, everybody has knowledge, let's share that. I think we can go a long ways. Thank you. Now I have a few uh, thank yous to do before we wrap up, but before we do that, I want to uh, get the audience, uh, you've been great uh, sending me questions. I'd like to ask the audience members to answer uh, two quick poll questions, if they can take a second to, to look at their screens and, and click on the, the session evaluation. And uh, you'll see question number one there, I'll leave you a good, uh, well, 30 seconds to, to, to give it a, a score. Uh, what is your level of understanding of the ways to engage with the 2030 Agenda National Strategy and goals related to health and climate change? So low to, to high level of understanding. And uh, I'll remind that the host and the panelists cannot vote. This is only for the audience. So we'll keep our fingers off the keyboard. And I think we can jump to the next question. 
Okay, I think we have yet one more slide. We'll do the final question. I think. Oh, we scroll down. Sorry, they're both there. My mistake. Uh, after participating in the session, what is your level of understanding of the actors involved in the overall landscape at the intersection of health and climate? And again, it's a one to 10 scale, low to high level of understanding. So while you uh, finish uh, answering those really two tough questions, I, I want to again thank the panelists uh, for their time and their insight and their thoughtfulness today. And Catherine, Shannon, Courtney, uh, Vincent, and Corinne, thank you again uh, for, for being so engaged. Uh, thank you, of course, to our audience. I hope you, you took a lot from this conversation. Uh, you didn't leave too, too depressed that we left you on a, a hopeful note. I'll just remind the audience finally that the next dialogue session as part of the intersection of health and the climate emergency series is planned for November 25th. That will be taking place during the annual Canadian Conference on Global Health. Uh, details can be found on the website of the Canadian Association for Global Health, and we hope to see you there. So again, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, stay safe and get vaccinated if you're not vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, Andre. And thank you, Andre, for uh, for agreeing to moderate this this stellar panel. Uh, you, you didn't leave us words words of your own uh, perception of, of optimism, your own message of op optimism, but I can feel it. I feel you're an optimistic uh, uh, champion for for this issue, and um, and we greatly appreciate your moderating of this of this event. So thank you very much.